Hi everyone, thank you so much for uh, coming for this open house on security practices in fintech. Uh, I'm Udbhav Tiwari and I work as a program manager at the Center for Internet and Society, uh, which is a NGO research organization based out of Bangalore and Delhi. Uh, what I'll quickly be doing is uh, sort of Uh, running you through what we'll be doing at this open house, uh, which is broadly telling you about what the research goal and questions that we have when it comes to security practices in fintech are, what is the work that we've done so far in this space, uh, certain guiding points for the participants who are there at the open house. We don't, I mean, I don't intend to talk for maybe more than like maybe another five or seven minutes uh, because this is largely an exercise to gather input from the industry to make sure that uh, I can look at, uh, as a part of the research, what the in, what people in the industry and civil society in generally think should be a part of security standards for financial technologies. Uh, and we'll be doing that under certain headings. Should I just recommend? And uh, in which we'll be looking at management, technical, and uh, other miscellaneous parts, which are three sort of broad categories within our research in which we've decided to look at uh, how FinTech operates in the country. And then finally, we'll sort of look at concluding points. Now, uh, the first like four, three points shouldn't take more than about five minutes. And most of the session should idly, is idly going to be about guiding points for the participants where I'm sort of going to ask uh, either both ask questions or just sort of leave the floor open for inputs that individuals would like to provide uh, once you understand our research a little better. And then from there, we'll probably have some sort of a discussion on what should or should not be a part of this standard. Uh, so just a very, very quick overview. The Center for Internet and Society is a research NGO that has offices in Bangalore and Delhi. And we've been operating in the tech policy space for about nine years now, where we've largely worked on privacy, internet governance, accessibility, access to knowledge where uh, Wikipedia India, uh, large parts of Wikipedia India are based out of CIS uh, in Bangalore. Uh, our work has had fairly decent amount of impact. We've been a part of a couple of government committees, the AP Shah committee that looked at privacy uh, and came out with the first government report on what or how the right to privacy should be implemented in India. Uh, some of this work has been used by the government and at fairly high levels. Like for example, very recently we were the only uh, NGO uh, and think tank depending on what you want to call us in India, that was quoted by the Supreme Court in the right to privacy judgment. So uh, the government has, uh, takes like at least a little bit of care to listen to what we're saying on certain subjects, uh, which we always try to ensure we do by gathering inputs from all the relevant stakeholders when it comes to a particular topic, uh, whether it be industry, civil society, consumer interest groups, and the government itself. Um, we've started working in the cybersecurity space very, very recently, only since 2016. And uh, we noticed that while we wanted to work on financial technologies, there was uh, in conversations that we had with certain consumer interest groups, as well as uh, some fintech companies, that there was a lack of coordination between regulators uh, in India, which are broadly either the Reserve Bank of India, uh, the Finance Ministry, and uh, uh, the Ministry of Information and Technology, which broadly regulate or have the remit to work in the fintech space. And therefore, we've decided to sort of uh, pursue uh, participation in standards development to ensure that we can contribute to this debate. Now we do this both domestically and internationally. So we uh, participate in the International Standards Organization as members of India, where and we are a part of the committee that develops ISO 27001, which is a standard that I'm sure at least some of you all are familiar with. Uh, and also domestically, where we take part in the Bureau of Indian Standards, that also develops a local and, do and, and domestic uh, financial standards as well. So the research goal that we essentially decided to embark upon this project, I think about four months ago, was to help the government and industry create a sectoral standard to govern security practices in the fintech industry in India. Now, uh, there was a very pressing need that we felt when we spoke to the industry of uh, consistency and of uh, uniformity in what an organization that's working in the digital finance space should follow in order to be compliant with the law. Uh, and this standard is sort of one means of doing that because of co-regulation, which I'll come to in a little bit. So the research questions that we asked ourselves were, uh, what are the current fintech security practices in the industry? What are the areas of governance and regulations when it comes to cybersecurity that could, be, that could benefit from co-regulation? 
uh, and I'll explain the term co-regulation in some time, uh, what form should this co-regulation take and what should be the substantive content of such a standard to satisfy the industry, government and civil society. Uh, now, the, the answer to the first question, which is what are current fintech security practices in the industry, uh, we broadly realize that at least when it comes to fintech, uh, there are none officially uh, that are negotiated, that, that are at least passed by the government. Uh, what we did notice was there were guidelines by the Reserve Bank of India on um, how cybersecurity should be implemented in banks. And I think at this point, it's sort of important to distinguish fintech organizations which uh, tend to work in either peer-to-peer -peer lending or digital payments as distinct from banks, uh, both for the level of uh, regulation that is imposed upon them by the government as well as the duty and obligation that they have to their consumers in order to uh, ensure that they're carrying out best, uh, like a certain minimum standard of best practices for security and privacy. Uh, so as a, when we realized that there was very little that was happening in the fintech security space in India and especially post demonetization that that space was booming, I think we've seen over 400 to 500% growth in digital transactions, uh, largely pushed by initiatives such as the UPI as well as pushing digital uh, payment methods over cash by the government. Uh, and which is why we uh, for, uh, signed an MOU with NCIIPC, which is the National Critical Information Protection Center in India. Uh, it's a central government agency based under in one of India's spy agencies, which is the NTRO, the National Technical Research Organization, that has the remit to control India and to control and to protect India's critical infrastructure from uh, attacks by foreign parties, uh, both physical, so little phys literally physical protection, but also digital, which includes cybersecurity. So we have a memorandum of understanding with them with the goal of eventually uh, helping NCIIPC uh, talk to the Prime Minister's office and some other organizations to uh, ensure that there is some sort of uniformity in how uh, the digital finance space is approaching security in the Indian context. And I think we signed this MOU sometime early, uh, like mid this year in March, uh, yeah, March, April 2017. Uh, so once we did that, we realized that um, we looked at sort of what are, uh, what form uh, this co-regulation could take, right? So co-regulation, just to sort of explain it really quickly, is when uh, uh, the, uh, the entity that is being regulated, as well as the government, which will pass the regulation, essentially decide to come into a room and carry out a form of regulation where there is accountability and a certain minimum standard that the government imposes upon them, but the act, uh, and maybe even uh, perform some level of enforcement, which is the government's primary job when it comes to regulation. But uh, the actual content of this regulation, as well as the manner in which it's implemented in the country, is done uh, with uh, by the industry. What that essentially ensures is that uh, the, these sort of regulations tend to be a lot more fluid, a lot more um, relevant to the industry, and there is a give and take between uh, the regulators and the industry as to what should or should not be a part of a standard. Now, the reason that this is particularly important for the fintech industry is twofold. One, uh, despite the numbers that we keep hearing about the fintech industry in India is in a very nascent stage, uh, which means that there are new startups that are pretty much starting up every single day or uh, in the fintech space that offer a variety of financial services, whether it be payment service providers on the web, whether it be uh, wallet apps, whether it be uh, tra uh, transactional apps like that enable UPI to be used in them. Um, uh, which in, uh, and regulation essentially can be a very big barrier to letting startups and young companies carry out what the goal of their organization is, uh, especially if these tend to be too cumbersome for entities that can be very, very young. So in a conversation that I had with uh, Nemo, uh, I think about th four, three, four, four, five weeks ago, he told me when Razorpay started off, when it comes to the number of employees present in the country, uh, in the company, there were just two employees when Razorpay actually started off. And if uh, to say, ask a company that has two employees to follow a standard like ISO 27001, which is a really detailed standard that takes lakhs if not crores of rupees to get yourself certified by and has some very detailed requirements, is an incredibly heavy task. And uh, the reason I mention ISO 27001 is uh, India actually already has a sort of a co-regulatory mechanism that is present in our law when it comes to information technology. So the IT Act and the 2000 level rules for reasonable security and best practices uh, have two provisions to say that an organization has met the threshold for carrying out uh, best practices when it comes to security and privacy. What this means is that if you can say that you have carried out the standards uh, or the requirements under that section, uh, 
then if you suffer from a breach or if you suffer from data, then you are not immediately culpable for uh, breaching the law or not protecting uh, your consumer data in or causing harm to your consumers. So this doesn't mean that as long as you say follow ISO 27001, you are free and you can get away with everything. But uh, it is the minimum standard that the law imposes upon you to say that you have carried out reasonable security and privacy best practices. Uh, the, uh, and the two things that uh, the 2011 rules say about this are one, that you simply get certified by ISO 27001. And the second is that a sector or an industry can come together, create its own set of standards, and then get them certified by the government. And if the government certifies those standards, then these become the standards for that industry. And as long as you follow that industry created but government certified standard, then you cannot, uh, then you will be uh, in compliance with the law when it comes to reasonable security and privacy best practices. Uh, now, even though this was passed in 2011, uh, most of the research that we've done shows us that there hasn't been a single instance of any industry passing such a standard. And there are some industries uh, that are far more long ingrained and uh, lot less agile, like say the energy sector, which tends to consist of uh, multi-billion dollar plants and energy grids that even that still haven't managed to really come up with the sectoral standard and get it certified by the industry. But uh, these have been present in the rules and we therefore thought that this would be a really good way to not only really help the fintech industry create a standard, but also then to take it to the government and say that this is an avenue of co-regulation where you can work with the industry to make sure that the standard that you impose is a standard that is ultimately followed by hopefully as many fintech players as possible. And the semantics of that is something that we actually hope to discuss in uh, this open house. And finally, we decided that uh, that the substantive content of these standards, while it could be based on other fintech standards like ISO 27001 and like PCI DSS, and I'm going to come to that, um, can can normally be very disabling for young or uh, young startups or young organizations to follow because of the weight of their requirements. So we essentially decided that uh, in the work that we've done so far, uh, we decided to categorize the requirements from laws and regulations that are already, that have already been passed for security in the digital finance space by both METI and RBI, as well as looking at digital finance standards like ISO 27001 that is more security than digital finance and PCI DSS, which is very specifically related to entities that deal with credit card information. Um, and what we've done so far is we've gone through these regulations and uh, I'll be happy uh, via Abhishek to share um, Excel sheet with all of you for the work that we've done so far in this categorization, but we've essentially categorized these requirements uh, uh, on the basis of what, ca of what they do in that organization. So for example, uh, there, are certain technical there are certain technical things like ensuring that your server is updated regularly, ensuring that uh, you have a password policy for how long the password has to be and how, and how frequently you have to change it. So very granular technical details to broader things like ensuring that the building in which uh, the server is housed must necessarily have a physical access system and that this physical access system uh, must necessarily undergo audits and the entire system and the infrastructure must go regularly undergo audits by auditors who are certified by ISO 27001. And these are just like small examples of I think easily over 350 to 400 points of different um, requirements under these laws and standards that we sort of categorized. And we currently have them in an Excel sheet. Uh, which I will share with you post this talk. And uh, then after that, we've now um, also had some interviews with um, uh, experts and industry practitioners to look at what they think about the industry, what their feeling is about does India need one? If India needs one, how should it be implemented? What should be a part of it? How easy should it be? How difficult should it be? What should be the minimum standard that even if you are um, a startup with just one individual, you must necessarily have uh, to ensure that if you're providing digital finance services, there is a, a base level of security. And uh, we've done about uh, four to five of these interviews so far, and we're now in the process of sort of also gathering community feedback to look at what the community thinks about this and what um, uh, the industry thinks should be a part of the standard as well. Uh, and that's broadly the work that we've done so far. Uh, these are the discussion points that I'm pretty much going to leave open to the house after a short introduction on each point. And uh, then I'm going to ask a couple of questions to which I would request you all to answer or give your opinions in whichever level, to whichever level you can. And uh, also to have a free flow discussion on each of them. I was hoping to give about at least 10 minutes to each of these points over the next hour so that we can collect uh, enough information. But if it turns out that one thing is more important than the other, then we can definitely 
uh, keep it agile. So uh, the first question, and uh, to this internally at CIS at least, we certainly already have a bit of an answer, and that answer is yes. But uh, is there a need for a, a sectoral standard when it comes to the financial technology space? Uh, we answer this question broadly at two levels. One, by looking at the Indian ecosystem, but also at looking at other countries uh, that tend to have very active financial regulators like the United Kingdom, like Singapore, like Australia, uh, all of which at some level do have security guidelines and standards that fintech companies, uh, even companies that operate inside regulatory sandboxes in these countries have to follow before they can provide services to the public at large. And a lot of uh, the points we've gathered have also been from these regulations in other countries to look at how they are doing this industry and consumer interest balance point as well. Uh, so at CIS, looking at the fact that other countries are doing it and looking at the fact that uh, reports of everything from debit card breaches to people's information being stolen from their wallets to poor security practices being followed in payment apps in uh, e-wallets, uh, we sort of positively affirmed the need for why sectoral standards in the fintech industry are important. Uh, the challenge that we had uh, after we came to that conclusion is defining what the fintech industry would be. So say, should a digital payments provider who operates a payment gateway on the web and on mobile be, be put to the same standard that a peer-to-peer -peer lender should? Uh, or is there some sort of a base minimum criteria that if you are dealing with technology that is uh, dealing with technology that deals with money or finance in any form at all that you need to follow as if you are providing it uh, to the public at large. Um, and we've largely decided that uh, while it is important to look at the different aspects of the fintech industry, that digital payments is the area where uh, the need for the standard is the greatest and that the minimum standards that we would come up with for digital payments could possibly be cross-applicable to some of the other areas in fintech as well, which is something that we're not sure about. So the question that I would ask you all is, do you all think uh, the fintech industry needs sectoral standards? Uh, and if so, why? Uh, but far more importantly, because we're very interested in the counter discourse, uh, if you don't think there is a need for a sectoral standard in the fintech industry in India, uh, why do you think that uh, shouldn't be one? And how can then security practices be ingrained into day-to-day uh, -day services of providers? So I leave this question sort of open to the floor. If any points or opinions or questions that you have uh, will be incredibly useful. Anything, Leo? Uh, I mean, yes. So could you give us some, I, and uh, we've come across some of these, but could you give us some examples of uh, standards or documents that at some level are binding that do have so such diverse? Security, I mean, apart from the CCI, uh, BSS, uh, which could be something that I don't really catch, but uh, we, we, we talked to the security Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So no, uh, that's something that we considered because uh, the problem, at least in the Indian context, was that even if you look at some of the biggest fintech apps in India that have billions of dollars of funding and are used by millions of people in India, uh, a majority of these practices that I am certain the developers working in these organizations uh, would be aware about simply are not followed. And the reason they aren't followed uh, can, of course, be twofold. The first one is, like you correctly pointed out, awareness. The fact that people don't know that these things can exist. But the second is that there isn't enough of a regulatory impetus for you to do that. 
Uh, no, so regulation can also impose a standard <coughs> that should be followed. So for example, if in the security standard we say that uh, for when it comes to both application and infrastructural security, you need to follow these two things, where we don't specify any of that detail at all. And whatever at that point at which you're getting certified, yeah. the details that are present within those standards are things you have to follow. The only way that becomes binding, or the only way that you can ensure that if you are a fintech company, say with a turnover of more than 10 lakh, then you have to follow it. And that's something that is not going to be a part of the standard, but can be a part of the regulatory recommendations that we make to the government. Then they will have to follow those developments that are clearly being created by industry and developers globally, but in the form of a standard. The alternative, of course, is that this is actually ingrained into law, which means it will become stagnant. It probably won't change for 10 to 15 years. And obviously, the space evolves so fast that it's really, really difficult for individuals to keep, like, in, like also be compliant with law or and also follow latest security practices, or if they're following latest security practices, and sometimes even not complying with the law because things get decomplicated all the time. So uh, that's actually... This is an interesting word that you used, uh, which is uh, certified. Uh, I don't know how uh, aware are you of uh, the uh, lag between what, uh, you know, there are two certification bodies in India at this yes. point uh, for uh, critical infrastructure. Yes. Absolutely. Barely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And that does not mean, and we're not just talking about how the process may have been subverted by federal interest groups or just the way uh, government machinery works. Right. So uh, I don't think the standard in any place should have the burden of enforcement okay. or regulation. Those okay. are two different uh, activities which are important. but. Uh, Absolutely. So the only response that I have to that is at a certain level, I think uh, maybe not the entirety of the standard, maybe not the, not the bulk of the processes, but if uh, the question of uh, certification, unlike the way it is right now, and you're completely right that it's sort of, you, they need to be empaneled with certain bodies and only the people who are empaneled can do it and the people who are empaneled tend to be the big four or certain other auditing agencies that have already been around for a long enough time that they tend to get all the business and even they charge those exorbitant rates that, you know, young startups can never really get certified by that. Uh, some of those things are process fixes. Uh, and in some of the conversations that we've had with the government, the government is more than willing to modify that process or change that process when it comes to financial technology. For example, there is a very, there's a very, very high chance that within the next three to four months, there is going to be a payments board, just uh, independent of the RBI, that is going to be set up uh, within the Ministry of Information Technology that is going to do a lot of this regulation. So say, and because it's going to be a clean start, like a fresh body to whom if the industry representation is made that if certification is the only form of enforcement, and which is why then it becomes different from regulation, then the certification should be easy, openly enforceable, maybe even should be self-certifiable, where there is a, sim there's literally a checklist with maybe 120 points at the end, which a company can say, I have done and tick off. And then maybe uh, just by self-certifying themselves, they would save a lot of the cost. Probably you would have to hire some consultants, but would save a lot of the cost, but would be liable if they haven't followed that minimum threshold as well. So these, these are things that we're accounting for in the standard. Um, these are also process oriented because I mean, this, like these are independent of the content of the standard itself. Uh, and that's the sort of two part of it, which is why if you see a component of the sectoral standards and strategies for balancing industry and consumer interest. A lot of the stuff that we've discussed in the last maybe five minutes would actually come in the strategies for balancing industry and consumer interest. Uh, but no, thank you so much. That was very useful. And it's also very interesting to get on record at some level the fact that uh, the current regulatory and certifying system when it comes to being available to uh, the fintech sector broadly is broken. And uh, if the standard were to say, just be plugged into that and become another thing that you have to follow, follow or certify, then it would just create more problems and not solve. Thank you.
because there is no regulation, there is no enforcement currently. So unless you fix that problem, uh, it's just more and more barriers you're adding to entry for a new company, uh, while there's no uh, enforcement happening. Uh, so I completely agree with you. In fact, um, uh, we've had some discussions with some fairly high level people in government about uh, the enforcement of uh, cyber, like you could say broadly the IT Act on things like uh, breaches, especially when it comes to privacy and why they aren't really prosecuted and why there's a problem uh, in that. Uh, and the only real response to that that I have is that I think there are two separate problems that are, that are interrelated, but with this project, uh, at least one of those problems, which is the problems of if you want to decrease the odds of those breaches happening, then what are the things that the industry should possibly be doing, even if they're just self-certifying themselves. So if there is a 10-page PDF that they can download with check boxes at the end, and as long as they check all those boxes, the odds of a breach happening are much lesser than a couple of developers over beers programming something and making sure that, like, and releasing it into the wild the next day. Okay, so... Uh, Certainly, you know, I completely agree with that. And which is why I said the second part of everything that he said about enforcement, effect, like how effective it is ensuring that the attacks, if they do take place, which they obviously will. In fact, maybe you're even painting a target on your back by self-certifying yourself, there's an the argument. The fact that we're having this discussion uh, basically increases the uh, barrier to, uh, for a startup to get their into this industry. Certainly. As soon as the government starts talking about things, the barrier to entry is weaker. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, to that, uh, when it comes to various other jurisdictions that are fairly uh, more business friendly, when especially to startups uh, than India is, whether it be the United States of America, whether it be the United Kingdom, and whether it be Australia, do have uh, complicated mechanisms, some such as regulatory sandboxes, where startups don't follow this standard, but a lowered standard, as long as it's below a certain level, and are put under sort of specific scrutiny, so as long as their turnover is below a certain amount, or they have fewer than certain employees, and they're of a certain age, then they can follow reduced standards, but are monitored closely to ensure that bad stuff does not happen. So it's, you can think of it as a, as a form of incubation of security practices into the organization, apart from, of course, regulatory practices, because um, for things like peer-to-peer -peer, uh, financing, you need to make sure that the money that you're lending out is backed up by sufficient guarantors and things like that. So these are reduced as well. So it's easier to be a startup in these regulatory sandboxes. And uh, the recent TRI consultation paper on data privacy also mentioned the notion of uh, data sandboxes, where data from various providers is aggregated into a sandbox and is then available, made available to use for certain entities that are specifically given permission to enter that sandbox and then play with the data to see what they can do while they are under scrutiny to make sure that some of the harm that would have happened if this would have just openly been either sold on the market without really looking at what sort of company has access to it or not. Uh, our solutions from a process way uh, that we would argue are better than nothing happening at all, which is the current status quo. So uh, at a certain level, I would have to agree that this is a barrier and is necessarily going to be a barrier, just like registering with the registrar of companies to open your company is a barrier, just like paying taxes is a barrier, just like making sure that you fireproof your building is a barrier. And yeah, exactly. But a necessary barrier uh, from various levels in what, yeah. Exactly. No, that I completely agree with. But uh, the goal of this, I think, is to pass it on to the government to make sure that uh, if they do come up with this, they don't come up with another law like the 2011 law that is frozen in time, incredibly hard to follow and doesn't really fix something. So that if the law is made and regardless of whether the industry wants it or not, I'm fairly certain that is going to happen. Like, and in a very, very short time where people are going to go, this security and privacy thing is a problem and we need to do something about it. Even, even the industry is actually one of the biggest proponents of that, uh, at least in terms of talking to the government to making sure that there is some sort of certainty with what should con constitutes and doesn't constitute security to inform that discourse so that if it does happen, it's as friendly to industry yet as uh, as like aligned with consumer interest uh, 
as it can possibly be for something that the government is passing. So this is just an attempt to make sure that presuming X is going to happen, how nice can you make X generally? Yeah, yeah of course, incredibly tough ask. Okay, fine. Uh, so uh, Pranav, who's also recording this document, has said that uh, only if you want to, because um, I can I understand that you come from companies and maybe your identity is something that you don't want to divulge. If you could, if you think it's okay, if you could introduce yourselves, uh, so that he could sort of just take down who is saying this broadly, and if you don't want to give your names or organization, just what you do would also be uh, sufficiently enough, just so that we also have that on record, right? Yeah. So could I just have your uh, details? I work in Africa. Okay. So he works at Africa. Uh, yeah, so any other points? I, yes. I have my, I have a question to the question of the Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in the economic challenge, can we be uh, more lenient than foundation for the local government? Uh, do they tend to uh, accumulate more options and do they tend to uh, uh, like exist? Are they more successful than uh, kind of very local sector? Yeah. So, uh, uh, Answering the second question first, are they more successful? Uh, almost certainly, yes. Like in terms of uh, how much easier it is for the industry to follow them, uh, how much easier it is for the industry to comply with them, and how much easier it is for the uh, industry to say to the government that we are doing enough uh, in a manner that is compliant with some sort of an international best practice, which is what, the, which is why the ISO 27001 has become as popular as the standard as as it has become, right? Because uh, they they tend to be individuals that would, uh, especially young companies, either a don't know enough or b the resources that they need to have access to in order to even comply with the regulations tend to be really really. High. You need to hire a lawyer. You need to ensure that you're regularly certified. You need to make sure you do your due diligence. And all of these things tend to be much easier if there is a standardized way of doing them that there are practitioners that become familiar with the entire process as a whole. So if you do have to undergo, say, a security audit, or if you're a government organization and you have to use ISO 27001, the ISO now has a document that says that if you're a government organization that uses ISO 27001, ideally this is how we think you should use it. That document does make it a lot easier, say, in this example, for even bureaucratic organizations like the government to be able to say that we are doing something which um, at least some people agree is something that should be done about this. And I, I know you've used the word something so many times because uh, that answers your first uh, to lead to the first question, which is of leniency. Yes, they do tend to be a lot more lenient than regulation. The reason they tend to be a lot more lenient than regulation is because one, the industry plays a very big role in creating them. Uh, the uh, ISO is pretty much full of auditors and companies uh, who are attempting to create standards for new upcoming areas of technology. Uh, and this does therefore make them more lenient, just like the point that was made a little earlier about uh, ensuring that standards don't become a barrier to business, uh, which is one. And uh, two is that uh, while they do get updated more frequently uh, than uh, regulation, for example, at the ISO uh, and at the BIS, uh, it is compulsory for every standard to be renewed uh, every three years. So if I pass a standard, if this standard at the BIS or the ISO is passed next year, say in March 2018, uh, by 21-22, uh, in that one year period, they will have to review the standard. And, and during the review, the process is actually fairly exhaustive. You have to look at who's using the standard. Is it being used enough? When people are using it, is there a, uh, are they facing problems with implementing it? Is it too hard? Is it too easy? Are there new systems that have come into place that make some parts of the standard redundant? Is there a better new, better standard that maybe covers a part of this standard so well that this standard should refer to that one? And this process normally takes between six months to a year. And uh, at the ISO, every year there are easily between 300 to 200 standards that are retired every year in their renew periods because they're either insufficient or because enough people do not renew, uh, like renew them. So uh, if we create a standard that is passed as one and it isn't used for three years, then that standard will simply die a death like a fairly poor one um, in the normal processes of standards are developed, which is remarkably different from regulation because regulation tends to be a lot more broad, lot broader. For example, you can't really have a regulation that says your password needs to be changed every 90 days. Uh, regula I mean, regulators have a problem doing that because what if, it, what if somebody doesn't do that? Then are they going to go behind every single person who hasn't changed their password in 90 days? Um, or... Uh, or it becomes too specific and you can't like govern generally or like 
uh, in as broad and normative as a manner as possible, which is what regulation normally tends to do. So uh, on both those questions, I think sectoral standards do tend to be effective. And even if you just look at not cyber security related standards and look at stuff like quality control management, right? Uh, the ISO 9000 series is the most widely certified uh, standard series in the world. And recently, uh, Nissan in Japan lost their uh, 9000 series certification because a couple of the technicians who were, and it's a quality control standard, who were performing certifications in, uh, on cars for whether parts were compliant with security guidelines, apparently had faked their certifications. And uh, they spent close to $300 million recalling every single car that was ever tested by somebody who had faked their certification and got their standard revoked, and now are trying to get that standard back. So there are various sectors or, uh, or components of op operations in companies where standards are considered gold. And uh, the reason, for example, it's so important for Nissan to get that standard back is because the Japan Japanese government mandates if you get certain state subsidies for manufacturing of cars and things like that, that you need to be compliant with a certain standard. So there are other forms of incentives apart from just enforcement that the government can also say. For example, if you're ISO 27001 compliant, maybe you literally need to pay lesser tax on certain transactions. Um, that can be used in order to in ensure that there are incentives to actually using a standard that actually lead to proper financial gain along with uh, security uh, for the end user and other intermediaries as well. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. So, no, incentives tend to work. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And no, so it's something that, uh, at least in the process of the standard, we are, we are sort of quite heavily thinking about including in the recommendations that uh, one of the one of the other parts of the cybersecurity projects are economic incentives for cybersecurity, whether this be research grants given to uh, universities to carry out research in cybersecurity, whether it be uh, funding in Ravi Shankar Prasad. I think three days ago on uh, a speech said that the government is willing to invest funds in startups that are specifically working in cybersecurity. There isn't a policy about it yet, but they have said that. Uh, the official Indian government procurement policy that was uh, open for comments last to last month officially said that when it comes to government's procurement for cybersecurity, if you're an Indian startup, then you would be preferred over other competing startups if we are procuring cybersecurity startups from you because they want to build an ecosystem. So we are looking at economic incentives at CIA. I mean, it's something that we, we are going to do in the second year of the project, which has started like four days ago. So uh, you will see some research coming out about what other countries are doing for economic incentives in cybersecurity, how effective they are, uh, if they are implemented in India, how should they be implemented, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, uh, and I think NIPFP, which is the National Institute for uh, fi uh, Financial Policy, which is in Delhi, uh, and is pretty much the Ministry of Finance and RBI's think tank that does a lot of this research is also considering doing research on this as well. So one, uh, we had, we've definitely thought of, so almost certainly actually will include recommendations um, along with the standard, the process part to say that uh, incentive should be a very big part of this where instead of say, like the government has been talking about uh, charging a security cess in every transaction, which is something that the government has been talking about where for every digital uh, uh, finance transaction that takes place, they'll charge a security cess and then use that money, apparently, for cyber security. Uh, on the other hand, you could uh, create a reverse incentive or a positive incentive where you actually make them pay a little lesser tax if they are following greater security standards and processes. And this, uh, especially in Israel, has, uh, been shown to have some remarkable effects on the startup ecosystem, which is why Israel has a reputation it does when it comes to cybersecurity and outsourcing its cybersecurity services. The gov government policies and government incentives have a lot, big part to do with that as well. Uh, so hopefully having covered the need for sectoral standards, uh, components of sectoral standards. So you had mentioned uh, like uh, application security, infrastructure security, and all of these different parts. Broadly speaking, we would uh, put them uh, under uh, technical, uh, but from a management perspective, right? Uh, having a policy in place that if a breach does happen, what will be done? Who are the people who will be informed? How soon will they be informed? How soon do they have to come to a decision? Do consumers have to be notified or not? If they don't, should the government be notified or not? All of these are also fairly important parts. And uh, especially considering the scenario that if we presume that the standard may reduce the number of attacks that take place, but attacks will still necessarily happen, a lot of the management stuff is what will ensure that the harm that can occur post the attack occurring is minimized as much as possible. So uh, this is also the part that we've spoken about the least in our interviews and our expert uh, conversations so far. So if you have 
recommendations for practices that are followed in the organizations you work for, uh, 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 practices that are followed globally that you think are good, uh, practices that if you're aware of are followed by countries, either in the form of regulation, say consumer breach notification laws, or even standards and other more informal forms of regulation that you think uh, we should look at as a part of our standard, uh, we would love to hear that from you. Especially, and this is super important because it's always the industry that will always give us, I think, the management part of this because uh, ISO 27001 is actually fairly silent on uh, things like policies and things like that. So they'll say you have to have an IT security policy and the IT security policy needs to cover these five points. But these, those five points tend to be incredibly generic that the organization itself can define how it is following them and then follow. So we would like to say, if we have to go down the route of self-certification and giving a checklist of things, so say, we can't just say, have a breach policy in the standard. We, we probably need to say, what should be the minimum component of a breach policy? Everything from notification to internal uh, company processes. So if there are any recommendations that uh, the room has on what we should look at, and this could th these could be very, very specific if you're aware of, uh, standards, numbers, or companies that have good policies, you can tell them uh, about, uh, tell us about that. We can approach these companies independently to see if we can have a look at them so that we can include them as a part of the standard. And as well as if you have specific suggestions, like, in, like super specific is fine, then we'd like to include them as well. Sure, that'll be wonderful. Yeah, that, that'll be useful. Because uh, normally it is so you talk about AWS things, but it's very well thought out. And uh, uh, from that, uh, companies big and small can actually create a, a business security framework that works for them while keeping in mind whatever else they're going to comply with. Right? But uh, one of the things that will always come in the way, uh, as soon as you start talking about enforcement, uh, economic incentives, disincentives, or even breach related things is the uh, you know the cost that comes with whatever uh, unplanned PR is required, right? Because once you make consumers aware, mm -hmm. and uh, there is like a, a hyperactive media, uh, uh, suddenly everywhere you see somebody saying bad name, right? <laughs> Irrespective of if they were saying mm -hmm. the uh, what has worked. Okay, so just to quickly answer that, it sort of does. It's a very nascent industry. Uh, some of the very big players like AIG, uh, which are global uh, cyber insurance like sort of behemoths, yeah. have entered into India. And uh, just sort of like quickly answering the question of cost, uh, uh, cost is the reason businesses pursue cyber security. Because the, co the cost of if things go wrong can, ten can be so catastrophic in the age of this much communication that balancing that cost uh, via insurance is actually one of the best ways to ensure that cybersecurity practices are being followed. So uh, I was in conversation with someone from AIG about three months ago, and they said that before they insure any organization above a certain level for cyber insurance, they themselves conduct an audit in order to come out with their quote of what should be, which actually goes through your security processes and sees what are the odds of a fact you will suffer a breach, and if you suffer from a breach, what are the processes that you have in place in order to be able to deal with them? So here we have uh, the cost, and then the insurance industry automatically sort of acting as a counter to ensure that even if the cost is a problem, the uh, organization or company follows certain minimum security standards in order to make sure that their insurance premiums aren't too high, or if to make sure that their coverage is wide enough. So that's a very, very valid point. It's something that uh, people have started talking about in India, um, some of the big four have started talking about it as well. I think PwC has some reports uh, on this and about why it's important that India enter this space. But one of the biggest reasons, for example, why two-factor authentication isn't a thing for credit card transactions in the developed world is simply because of the insurance industry. Because every time there is a cost, they simply offset it with that. So if it becomes blanket and completely applicable, there is an argument to be made if you're coming from the pure privacy and security viewpoint that it may be a little bit of a bad thing, which is why, for example, even though that they've had the technology to enforce OTPs, OTOTPs, 
for decades now, the, real, the only real ha reason it hasn't been done is because they don't have to, because it's cheaper to pay the premium uh, and get all the losses covered than actually go through that complete infrastructural change. So uh, some of the changes that are taking place in the European Union, uh, especially with the GDPR that's going to come into force next year, are forcing companies to change that, uh, which is. Okay. Yeah. No. I mean, at least uh, from uh, my conversations with the auditors at the ISO, they're crying about. Interesting. Yeah, so I mean, I, at the minimum, I think this is an attempt to make sure that there is something there, that if people do want to follow it. Uh, So clearly then in this, like along with the recommendations that we make along with the standard, uh, apart from just pure consumer awareness, even developer awareness, and that's, this is now a question of pretty much education, right? Because ensuring that it's a part of curriculum, ensuring that uh, if there is industry certifications, they mandate a certain level of like updated security practices are probably the only organic long term, definitely not short or medium term way to fix some of those problems. But yeah, no, we'll make sure to take note of that point. Thanks. Uh, So if I can, right. No, so security reports don't necessarily have to be released to the public, but I think there is a middle ground between doing what happened yeah, in Hitachi and doing everything. And I thought of. Uh, they have an internal 
Absolutely. So I mean, two angles. One, uh, at a minimum, consumer breach notification would not apply to that because consumers didn't get affected. The bank did. And uh, if you like, one, two, uh, I would love for there to be a consumer breach notification law, which we have, we don't, we don't even have. That maybe even imposes that obligation upon companies that if you suff like suffer a loss at a certain level or above a certain magnitude, then you have to report it at a minimum, if not to the public, then to the government. So that the government can then take the call of whether it should be reported to the public or not, whether there should be an annual audit report, whether government comes out maybe once every year, maybe even partially anonymized if it has to, if it's really sensitive. But largely, like Amy said, I think like the public shaming and public disclosure is one of the best incentives that consumers as entities, and presuming that they do have rights in this entire game of profit and loss and barriers to companies, uh, can take, can like do, is to ensure that like you said, right, if, if the money is going to move somewhere else and if people are going to go and say to individuals, I'm not going to use your products and services, if those products and services screw them over, then it's their obligation to make sure that they know that they got screwed over before these consumers move on somewhere else. So at least internationally speaking, right, like the, uh, the arguments that you made is the singular reason America does not have a federal breach notification law yet. But 51 states in America have a breach notification law because even though there hasn't been national consensus on this and the days may be 30, 60 or 90 and a lot of semantics have been debated about. But even countries in which technology is a far greater part of their ecosystem and contributes to a far bigger part of their GDP than it even does in India have decided to proceed down this road. And regulators have gone, we understand that this is going to be a barrier or it's going to be a harm and there are some times in which it can get completely out of control. But nevertheless, we do have to do this because this is given how fast this space is changing and how much harder it is to regulate. And that, with that, I'm trying to sort of answer your question, right? Like, when it comes to enforcement and regulation, there are two broad ways in which you do so. One is competition, com like, follow the sort of model where the Competition Commission of India works, right? So the Competition Commission of India uh, can investigate you for competition crimes in two ways. Uh, one is if someone complains and then there's a report and an investigation. And the second is it can proactively decide to uh, conduct something known as dawn raids, where they literally just turn up and say hi, so can we have a look at like these logs and these records? And when it comes to uh, judicial power, they are incredibly powerful. So the FTC is an organization that does this in the United States of America. The CCI is this in India. And uh, like they have investigatory powers. Anything that the police can do, the Com Competition Commission of India can come and ask you for all of that information while respecting your confidentiality, which is also present in the law. But you can never tell the Competition Commission of India, we think this is private or this is our source code. You can tell them, you can tell them you can see this. If, if you share this with anyone, then you have to compensate us for any loss that we suffer from. And like there are agreements that are signed between like uh, regulators and companies sometimes. But they have the right to come and investigate at any point that they want. And sometimes they do this due to uh, whistleblower mechanisms where if people think that something is happening, for example, just what you said with the bank, right? And those many thousands of credit cards that were leaked and how nobody really found out about it. If anyone in that bank and if such a neat, uh, say, entity was present in India for digital crime, if there was whistleblower protection where the comp person could have gone and told the comp and told the regulator this happened in the bank this caused this much loss this clearly showed that security pressures were not being followed in the bank can you please come and investigate this because i think it's a problem as a whistleblower recognizing that he is doing something despite being a part of their organization then in places like america there are protections given to such individuals both so sometimes even No, not at all. So this was answering his standard. Like whistleblower protection is definitely not going to be a part of the standard at all. This is just to answer the question of breach notifications. Yeah, and if they have, uh, there's a breach and they never notify anyone. At all, right? They never find yeah, no, so then there's, uh, and then obviously that, that is a legal thing that you will have to prove if someone comes to you and says you had a breach but you never found out about it. And if they make the statement we never found out, then they'll have to prove the statement that they never found out. And if they never found out, then if it's if there wasn't any malified intent because it's very hard to determine I didn't find out about it versus oops I'm sorry I didn't leave those two lines in a log and I ended up losing a hundred million dollars and I think regulators can be smart enough to be able to distinguish that in like the world at least from the way that at least op in it operates in other countries right but I also think it'd be sort of wearing off point because it's not really uh, related to this so quickly for management uh, you told us about the AWS uh, security handbook Apart from that, are there any other practices, any other co companies who you think uh, have good, uh, si like sort of systemic processes in place that um, have a good reputation uh, within the industry would be very useful because then we can approach them and even under an NDA if we have to look at them to see what these practices are so that we don't disclose them but learn from them and see what parts of those 
are easy to follow and can be incorporated otherwise uh, would be very useful. This doesn't have to be something that you do in a public forum. Uh, my ID is there at the end of this email. If you can just share that, uh, it would be very useful just to inform us and what we could and could not do. So, yeah. Uh, we internally try to follow the Google FRA handbook. Okay. Uh, that we've seen. And uh, that's really helpful in terms of how to handle incidents while it's happening. Okay. Uh, it doesn't cover the large parts of how to do things. It doesn't talk about what Google's policies on those matters. But it's really nice and if an incident is happening, these are the five things you should take care of. Okay. Awesome. So, Google, AWS. Uh, and then apart from that, I mean, if there are any things that you think you can share, or even privately, it would be super helpful. Even the, these, uh, these critical uh, windows across where you find mm -hmm. actually have the same types of things all in those prompts. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so those I've seen, definitely. Yeah, so, I mean, some parts of that are there in our breach section, notification section. But I'll be sure to look at them again to see if there are more things. Uh, most, uh, some of that we sort of included in miscellaneous, but I'll look at it again from the management lens and see if there's other stuff that we can pick out from that. Now, uh, the other thing in, in this, we've actually had a fair bit of discussion, uh, at least in the interviews, um, are what, what should be the technical makeup of the standard? How specific should it be? How generic should it be? Should you say, do simple things like literally mandate encryption between endpoints or the strength of encryption at a minimum level, not a maximum strength? Uh, that should be followed, so to make sure that the data is safe in a, a certain way. Two super granular things like your password needs to have special character number and capital letter and stuff like that, right? So uh, we obviously have to at some level achieve a middle ground. Like you, you cannot be too sp uh, specific because then it becomes cumbersome. Uh, but you also cannot be too high level because if you're providing technical details, especially at a ambit of cell certification, it needs to be easily verifiable whether that was followed or not. So uh, we've heard uh, of everything from, uh, discussed everything from having an update policy where if there are uh, in the softwares that you use, if there is uh, if there are bugs or vulnerabilities that are publicly reported, there needs to be a time-bound time in which you fix them in your update policy internally in the organization. So if you use open source um, or even closed source uh, systems and in the CVE uh, tracker in America, there is a vulnerability about that system, then you have an obligation to make sure that your consumers are not affected by it in a reasonable time frame uh, as possible. That's something that people have discussed. We've discussed um, app-level security where things like um, both sides, like I've had discussions why code obfuscation is a good thing, and I've also had discussions of why obscurity by security, uh, security by obscurity is a bad thing, and why it can be harmful and it's not good enough. Uh, some discussions about uh, DNSSEC and HTTPS spinning to make sure that um, endpoints aren't captured. And so this is an area that, uh, so I'm, I'm a lawyer by training, but I'm sort of familiar with technology and its jargon, nowhere close to I'm sure the technical competence in this room. But uh, any suggestions that I could get on it would be incredibly useful. Uh, if, even if these suggestions are, I think these five things are necessary and important and should be there, and these five things are so cumbersome that they should definitely not be there, even though people have already spoken about them and there has been some discourse about it. So uh, any technical things that in this standard you think should be present would be very useful. Yeah. Yes. And it also understands, say, follow LISD. Yes, uh, absolutely. If you're handling car data, you could say follow PKA also. But uh, these are the Indian specific things. How do you handle bank uh, security information, for example, which is very prevalent in the Indian fintech market? So I think those are the four things that uh, you should try to focus on. So you were asked about the 1974, which <coughs> was allowed to store social security numbers for a lot of purposes, and that was how you handled what now we do with social security policy. And then part of the act during that group moved and became a standard that you weren't allowed to store it, but I know there's a Uh, so we don't. Uh, they have disaster. 
No, but, but uh, I would love to have this setting of standards. Since yeah, so I'm dealing with data, this yeah. Is the so I mean, uh, at least for what we currently plan to include, uh, just like PCI DSS uh, and how it deals with the card number, we plan to sort of uh, come up with an exhaustive list of what is sensitive information that shouldn't be stored in its entirety by the operator, uh, such as all 16 digits or all if you're using Dynastar 14 digits of uh, your card number. Uh, whether it be the Aadhaar number, whether it be any other form of authentication that primarily essentially serves as a username for any authentication based service, apart from maybe the username to the service itself because that would be necessary to, for you to get in, should never be stored by the provider uh, uh, in plain text and unencrypted format and even if the provider does deal with them, then it should never store them, which is pretty much how C, uh, CVV numbers are dealt with in PCI DSS. So for a lot of... Uh, Yeah, so which is why, yeah, no, so we, we definitely plan to, like, which is why I said exhaustive. Like, it's not going to be a list that says whatever the government defines as uh, PPI. Like, because if you do that, then it en ends up becoming on almost impossible to run any server because you need to have a unique identifier and unless, and you can't really have that unique identifier sort of encrypted. Uh, but, uh, but to make sure that things that are problematic, like whether it be your uh, Aadhaar number, whether it be, your electoral ID card number, whether it be your passport number, things that are actually sensitive. Uh, and, and we definitely don't plan to include like name and date. Uh, we don't plan to include phone numbers after some of the conversations that we've had with uh, people in GEO and some other organizations because of how they internally use it. But uh, we do plan, I think we may, uh, this is an open-ended idea, it's not there in the standard at all, but create a middle ground between you can do whatever you want with it, you have to be careful with it, you can never ever touch it at all, which is sort of how uh, PCI, CI, DSS also does it in that table with whether you, what, what you can do with it as a checkbox for what things you can do. So we sort of plan to recreate that table for the standard and sort of categorize what kinds of information at least should or should not be present in it. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, I think um, Nemo's question about how other fintech companies are dealing with this broadly in terms of even if you just want to quote general industry experience or grapevine information, it would be really useful. So if you have any inputs, then it would be very useful because then we can like go back and study them on the internet and make sure that we're actually following them. Okay, you want to share that with us, no? Okay. Okay, fine, so I hope the mic didn't catch that. But um, uh, that's technical. If there's anything else in technical uh, that you'd want to talk about, uh, okay, I'm getting the sense not. But if there is, I'm sh firstly, I'm sure that from both the guidebook, the guidebook that you recommended, I remember, has some technical things that individuals can follow as well. We're going to look at that a lot more carefully to see whether we can include stuff. But if you do come across resources generally on the internet, please do share them with us because uh, one of the things, apart from this standard creation that we plan to do is also sort of create a guidebook uh, for companies. Like, I mean, put it, um, open source is important on the internet essentially so that uh, if you are a developer and whether you're starting out or you're like uh, incredibly big NBFC, um, you can have a look at like what are the top 10 guides that you should read before you develop an application that's dealing with fintech security. So we do plan to do some of that consumer awareness and spreading part both by tying up with other organizations that do this. I actually have a question, I don't know if you know what the answer to this, is uh, why don't you have domain uh, registration for blockchain? Yeah, okay, yeah, so I do. <laughs> But uh, it's because, uh, so how the ICANN, which is the international organization that gives out domain numbers works, is uh, it delegates a national agency yeah. in every country. Uh, the national agency in India is NICSI. Yeah, uh, yeah sort of went there. <laughs> like, because uh, um, NICSI isn't really very good with some of the stuff uh, that they do uh, on uh, maintenance of, especially the domain name part, because uh, now I just, I, I, why don't I answer the rest of the question to you privately and not on a live stream, right? Because uh, mostly it has to do with processes and subcontracting and uh, how well these uh, subcontracts are drafted and the, and the contents of these subcontracts in terms of if we ask you to do something, how soon do you have to do it? What sort of responsibility do you have to do it? So um, it's a fairly complicated process internally, but because of that, a lot of these things simply haven't trickled down yet because uh, the biggest reason is actually the fact that, and this I've heard from in discussions at, related to the ICANN before because there isn't enough of a demand for it. 
So unless enough people are asking for it, which in their eyes is a substantial number or big, uh, like little conglomerates that are asking for this and actually have an incentive for them to do so, they simply don't think it's worth their time and their money to be able to do it. Uh, unlike most other countries, um, it's not given to a government agency. It's uh, normally given to some sort of a multi-stakeholder body that has both government and industry present there. So um, if that ends up happening, then these things tend to be a lot faster in those countries because there's an act active conversation about what should happen and what should not happen. Uh, but yeah, so that's sort of kind of the reason. Um, and broadly then, if there's anything else miscellaneously that you think should or should not be present in the standard, uh, any other broad comments that you'd like to make? Uh, would be super helpful. No? Okay, I think we've had fairly uh, enough of a discussion. I'll quickly wrap up in saying uh, strategies for balancing industry and consumer interest even in this discussion and in every interview that I've had before this has been the most difficult part of creating such a standard. And uh, CIS in 2000, between 2011 to 2013 uh, dra had a draft privacy bill as well where we uh, worked with industry and civil society to come up with a draft privacy bill that India could possibly pass right after the AP Shah report. And uh, if there's one thing that sort of taught us, it was that it is impossible to make everyone happy. Uh, and it's also impossible to make like even some people happy. Like at, at, like at least in the sectoral standard, I'm sure security researchers are good, like in that we pass, no matter how draft or how final it is, I'm sure every single stakeholder, whether it be researchers, academia, civil society, industry, government, everyone's gonna be unhappy about something. Everyone's gonna, like some of them are gonna pay a lot of money to make sure something is not in it. Some people are uh, going to be willing to be, willing to protest to the ends of the earth to make sure something is in it. So it's gonna be a very like, it's, it's a politically <laughs> flawed task and it's very, very difficult to balance that interest. Um, and in some ways you can also say it's a task that we know that in some level we are never really going to completely succeed in having that 50-50 balance that we actually want to have. What we do want to do is to make sure that we do as good a job as possible and uh, to sort of categorize things into non-negotiables, into things that are open to nego uh, that are more open to negotiable but we want them to happen and things that we're okay with losing. And that will require like a fair bit of I mean, whatever level of political maneuvering that we can do uh, in discussions between industry and consumer interest in saying these are your needs, these are their needs, let's look at what is the best way in which we can come to a common ground. Uh, we plan to do this in the form of open round tables uh, and some closed door round tables that we plan to have in at least four cities, uh, Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, and uh, maybe Chennai, or maybe one more in Bombay. We aren't sure about that over the next six months. Maybe <laughs> Fine, uh, maybe Chennai was, uh, anyways. Uh, uh, when, uh, now, because we want to do, uh, when we do that, the goal of that is essentially going to be to do a lot of this balancing. Because we're gonna have drafts of the standard that people are gonna be able to see, give their comments on, and we'll have comment periods, then discussions, and then sort of repeat the process a couple of times to make sure that we arrive at this balance as well as possible. So, um, I'm gonna share that Excel sheet with you all, so that uh, if there are things you, if there are documents you think we're not looking at, you can add them. If there are things you think should or should not be a part, you can tell us. If there are, I, it's gonna be view only access so that you can't change it. But uh, if any comments on any part of that sheet that you want to send us via email, we will be more than happy uh, to look at and to include. It's something that we completely recognize as a space that we are young at and new at. And uh, the industry itself is changing at such a rapid pace that unless we keep, um, keep like a hand in the pulse of what is actually happening, the odds of this actually getting accepted are negligible. So we need to make sure that like, the main people to whom this is going to affect, aka the industry, are aware of it, and are and we are listening to everything that they're going to have to say. Right. So I think that is it. Thank you so much uh, for sitting and listening to me ramble, and for all your very very valuable inputs that I'm sure uh, we learned a fair bit from. And uh, this is my email ID in case uh, you want to get in touch for sharing uh, items or just generally keeping in touch or learning more about us. And thank you so much to Hasgeek for giving us the venue and for live streaming it and setting it all up. It's uh, really nice to be able to sort of interface with the industry via Hasgeek, which we also hope to keep doing in the future at their other events as well. Thank you. Seven months. Seven to eight months, yeah, approximately. June next year, ideally, like 15th June is what we thought could be a time that we want to definitely be done with it. Uh, so 15 June is probably like take to the government level and then maybe after government has some more feedback, maybe have another round. So by August, 
done for sure, sh like finished the project, but June, otherwise 15 June. So the next seven months broadly are when most of this work is going to happen. So I have a question. Yes. So have you considered anything that uh, these standards try to avoid a false sense of security? Like if some organization takes a standard and they follow it yes. properly. Yes. Okay. Uh, looking at larger companies, many of the companies who have extensive compliances and processes still have been compromised many a time. So how do you balance that? Or yeah. at least you know make your uh, the people who are interested in going ahead with this standard that this is not the end of the world. There are other things. Also yes, absolutely. Not create a false sense of security. Yes. Yeah, exactly. No, so it is definitely like you know that uh, that aspect of like security theater and how standards are security theater just to make people feel like you know they are safe and secure. And whether the people is government, whether the people is consumer interest yeah. groups, or whether it's your own board, right? Because uh, that's also something that we've had where uh, like security teams within uh, companies complain about how much money they get from their board, uh, the amount of leeway that they're given in implementing their independent processes that will definitely include security, maybe sometimes even without really increasing costs, but they're not allowed to do because it clashes with some other policy. This is especially true in really big industry conglomerates. Uh, uh, one, one part of it is I think any reasonably aware person who implements standards from the perspective of making sure they never get breached or hacked again clearly isn't in the right business slash game. And uh, that's something that I think the government is definitely very aware of in the conversations that we've had. They know that if just because we passed the standard doesn't mean that maybe the same uh, number of breaks. Really exactly. Continuous, continuous awareness. Continuous awareness and. The fact that the standard will include something like breach yeah. notification is. <laughs> yeah. We, we have a plan for this. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, so security theater is a problem. Uh, and. Uh, I don't think anyone, may, I mean, maybe we will include it at the end of the standard as a footnote that this standard does not mean that you are now secure and you definitely need to do a bunch of other stuff, so please make sure you're doing it. But, uh, uh, but short of that, no, that, you're right. I mean, it's an industry, it's a, that's, that's actually an industry thing that the industry actually has figured out how it, act, it, it solves, whether internally in processes, whether in industry bodies like DSCI and NASCOM, uh, which actually does a fair bit. So DSCI does do a fair bit in sort of educating at least internally individuals about it. Not enough, I personally think, but uh, they do. They, it's much better than not having it at all. So yeah, that's the only real way of solving that. Um, and broadly, just increasing the level of education and awareness on security practices among developers, yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. No, but I think, yeah, unless there's anything else or any other comments, I think we will wrap it up and then we can like all talk. Thanks.